Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I think you can hear me very clearly. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mustafa, for introducing me to the audience. And for me, it's a privilege that this is my second time uh, that I am in the, in the Jordan University of Science and Technology. My first time was in April 2019, and uh, I had a lecture in the very same hall about the topic of At that time, I was talking about panoramic radiography. And uh, today, uh, I'm going to tell you about imaging diagnostics of salivary glands, as well as uh, temporomandibular joints. But uh, since you are still coming to the lecture, and uh, I don't want uh, to starts with a topic before you take I don't know uh, it was terrible uh, so um, first I would like to present uh, my faculty to you and uh, I am here to get one of the vice deans from the faculty and uh, we are medical faculty uh, faculty <coughs> of medical dentistry in <coughs> there's something definitely wrong with this mic <laughs> okay uh, so um okay so here with one of the and this is the dean of our faculty, uh, Professor Renata Hawas, who could not join us for this visit in uh, Erbit this time. Hawas uh, is the head of oral medicine department of our faculty. And uh, you can uh, find me in the middle of this picture, and uh, Professor Jarosław Sobieszczański is also there in the front row, waving to you. And Professor uh, Katarzyna uh, Sarnawoś, uh, is a professor in prostodontics and uh, she could not join us uh, here as well. Uh, we uh, teach uh, in uh, modern facilities. One of them is the Center of Medical Simulation. Uh, professor Sobieszczański had a lecture about simulation yesterday at the uh, faculty. And so uh, you can see our students uh, taking classes in preclinical teaching uh, here. And uh, one of uh, our parts of teaching is uh, haptic simulation with the newest purchase for the uh, faculty, which are haptic uh, phantoms uh, for uh, simulation uh, in um, uh, dentistry. But uh, Professor Sobieszczański is an expert on that, so I'm an expert on uh, dental maxillofacial radiology. And this is where our dental school is uh, located. Dr. Mustafa had the chance to visit us in Lublin before COVID pandemic in October 2019, but at that time we were located in two old buildings, one in the middle of the city and one in the older quarter of the city. Now we moved to the campus, so we are just a few footsteps from the center of medical uh, education, and this is our dental school, and this part is uh, my department in the second floor, and uh, the building um, um, houses, of course, all the departments for clinical teaching and uh, the facilities for um, uh, patients. So here you can have a look at uh, a few pictures from the clinics in the uh, new building. And uh, this is my department of dental maxillofacial radiology. Uh, so we've got cone beam CT with panoramic. Uh, we've got two panoramic machines uh, with um, cephalometric units. Uh, we've got in total free intraoral units and also ultrasound uh, lab. So these are the departments uh, of uh, our faculty and as you can see we cover everything in uh, dentistry and at this time we teach uh, students in dentistry in Polish, students in dentistry in English, uh, dental technology, dental hygiene and radiography as bachelor studies in Polish as well as master's uh, course in radiography for Polish students. As, as you can see in the slides I think our 
students are pretty happy uh, when having classes with us. We also teach postgraduate students, uh, residents, uh, and we organize courses in both uh, postgraduate education and continuous education. Our faculty members uh, work with research teams with various grants. For example, this, this is the National Center of Science in Poland. Uh, they also publish patents. They uh, write books, textbooks, and uh, a lot of these in the slides are like my babies in Polish about uh, dental maxillofacial radiology. But now I started publishing also in English. So if you're interested in uh, dental maxillofacial radiology, uh, these are the textbooks uh, you can use in your future careers. And uh, one of the topics of the lecture for today is temporomandibular joints. So you can find much more information in this textbook. And if you are interested in basic uh, radiography and radiology, you can go for this one. And uh, the Atlas of Cone Beam CT will be published in March next year. Uh, our faculty members also work in uh, different uh, journals, Polish and international journals. Uh, we are board members, we are uh, editors uh, in chief, and uh, our scientists also are. Uh, uh, very highly ranked and, uh, for example, Professor Jolanta Szymańska is included in the top uh, world's 2% of scientists list uh, elaborated by the Stanford University second year in a row. We are also members of Polish Academy of Science and we've got international corporations and one of the uh, valued uh, corporations with it, Erasmus Plus program is the cooperation with the Jordan University of Science and Technology, of course. And we work uh, within uh, different international associations. I currently serve as a immediate past president of European Academy of Dental Maxillofacial Radiology and uh, European Regional Director for International Association of Dental Maxillofacial Radiology. I'm going to organize European Congress in my field. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, it will be online only, but maybe this way it will be more accessible accessible for international participants. If you're interested in uh, information about our university and our research papers, you can go to our website. And uh, last but not least, I would like to uh, tell you that um, our faculty members are not only dedicated teachers and uh, researchers and practi pr practitioners, but they also uh, make f impossible things uh, possible. For example, our colleague from conservative dentistry, Dr. Małgorzata strychasz dudziak uh, she uh, has uh, impaired hearing and she hears owing to cochlear implants, but she still proceeds with her career as a musician. And for example, on YouTube, you can find videos of her performing with uh, very uh, known uh, Polish musicians, for example, in the Warsaw Philcar Philharmonic uh, House. And um, our colleague, Dr. Leszek Szalewski, he is very fond of photography, and he teaches dental photography to our students. He will be responsible for digital dentistry teaching in our university very soon. But he is also a very skillful photographer of nature. And this is one of the pictures he took. Uh, this is the Milky Way. And uh, every year he goes uh, to Polish mountains to an area with very little artificial light so that uh, he can uh, photo take beautiful photos. And uh, within the cooperation uh, between our universities, uh, we uh, have also possibility of students exchange. So if you decide to uh, come to Lublin, uh, you are most uh, welcome. Our city is not, of course, not as historical as Jordan, but um, for Poland, it's one of the oldest cities. Uh, it received the city charter in 1317. And at one time in history, it was the second royal city in our country, and uh, twice in the history, it also served as capital city of Poland, and uh, it was immediately after World War I and World War II.
Okay, so uh, that was a brief presentation of um, our faculty so that you know uh, where we uh, come from. And now I would like to uh, start with the uh, first uh, topic of uh, my presentation. So this is uh, salivary gland uh, imaging. And um, in this slide, uh, you can see uh, different imaging modalities that can be used for uh, imaging of uh, salivary glands. And this is very logical, but since you have a lot of uh, imaging methods, it means that none of them is perfect. It means that uh, you need to use all of them to a certain extent, and uh, they complement uh, each other. Uh, if one of them was far superior to other methods, uh, the other ones would no longer be used in clinical practice. So, so since we still use them, it means that uh, they all have some pros and cons. For example, uh, the radiographs will uh, radio stones. Also, it's commonly lights in uh, clinical practice, and so I will tell you much more about ultrasound within the course of our lecture. In cone beam computed tomography, you can also observe uh, structures that are calcified, like uh, salivary stones, as well as bone destruction and tumors. Uh, cone beam computed tomography demonstrates both uh, lesions in bone and salivary gland stones, but it also uh, allows uh, imaging of soft tissues, hence it's applied in tumor cyst inflammations. For magnetic resonance, it's based mostly on uh, visualization of soft tissues, uh, so we apply it uh, mostly in advanced cases such as uh, tumors and uh, cysts, and uh, we can perform MR, MR cyalography or virtual endoscopy. For cyalography, which is a contrast uh, imaging study uh, of salivary gland, it's not so commonly applied nowadays. Cyalography is a little bit like a unicorn. Tales about unicorns, but you have never seen a unicorn in your life, probably, apart from some uh, children's toys. So this is, uh, at least in our country, this is the case of cyalography. Uh, when you take any textbook in uh, maxillofacial or oral surgery, they will tell you in the textbooks that cyalography is the method of choice for imaging of salivary stones, which is not true. For example, currently in our country, there is no center performing cyalography. On the other hand, ultrasound is performed very widely, and in fact, um, ultrasound imaging of salivary glands does not necessarily have to be delivered by an expert in oral maxillofacial radiology. It can be done by a medical uh, radiologist. So please remember that uh, cyalography cannot be considered first line diagnostic imaging method in uh, cyalithiasis due to low availability and um, high radiation. Just to give you an idea, um, uh, cyalography is based on uh, contrast enhancement of uh, ducts of salivary glands, and it's uh, divided into three phases, preoperative phase, filling phase, and emptying phase. And for a preoperative uh, cyalography phase, it's mandatory that the radiographs are taken uh, without contrast before the contrast media is injected into the ducts. And this is the baseline uh, radiograph for comparison. Then in the filling phase, uh, iodine-based uh, contrast media is orifice of the salivary And uh, the ducts, uh, uh, salivary glands are filled with contrast medium. At that time, radiographs are taken, ideally at least 
to at different um, angulation. And then in emptying the phase, the cannula is uh, removed and the patient is allowed to rinse out. Uh, sometimes, uh, for example, uh, lemon juice can be administered to the patient to speed up emptying of uh, the ducts. And after one and five minutes, x-rays are taken as uh, well. So, um, what are the indications for cyanography? In fact, very few are left uh, nowadays. And it's mostly used as an initial phase for uh, interventional procedures, uh, such as, for example, balloon dilatation of strictures of uh, salivary ducts, as well as, for example, retrieval of stones from the ducts. Uh, for contraindications, of course, any acute process within the salivary glands uh, will be contraindication, as uh, we cannot administer contrast media to an inflamed gland, glands, as it will pass uh, to the parenchyma from um, the ducts, and uh, also when the calculus is very close to the orifice of the salivary duct, then administration of contrast medium can in fact push the stone back in the stone in the duct, and it will be uh, it will be do more harm to the patient than uh, to diagnosis. Uh, for the filling uh, of salivary uh, ducts, uh, the, the here you can see an example of a normal parotid cyanography, and the image is compared to a tree without leaves. It's difficult to be observed in uh, Jordan, probably, because you've got trees all year round so, uh, filled with leaves, like, for example, uh, olive trees. But in Poland, at this moment, uh, the trees are bare because uh, all the, tea, the leaves were already lost in uh, November. In fact, yesterday it was snowing in our city, so we are very happy to be here in Jordan. I, I understand that the weather might be pretty chilly for you, but for us it's like nice uh, spring. And um, for uh, submandibular sub glands, the image is compared to a bush in winter, so a bush without leaves. Yes, in Poland, we also have bushes with, uh, without leaves right now. Uh, so the gland is smaller, but uh, it's uh, um, important to know that the main duct uh, is wider than the duct of a parotid. So the Wharton's duct is wider than the Stenson's duct. And um, nowadays, uh, cyanography can be performed also using MRI. I have already mentioned. And so in MRI, we don't use ionizing radiation. Therefore, uh, the examination is safe for the patients. And for interventional uh, cyanography, these are pictures I obtained from my colleague, Nick Drage, who is head of oral and maxillofacial uh, radiology in Cardiff in Wales in the United Kingdom. And they perform a lot of interventional procedures. So this is fluoroscopy, so let, like say, let's say radiographic television. So uh, live supervision of um, administration of contrast. You can see contrast media in the catheter and then the filled duct. And the arrows with number two an area in the duct with filling defects. And uh, before and uh, after the filling defect in the duct, uh, you can see dilatation. And what does it mean? It means that the stone is radiolucent, so it's not calcified enough to be visible in a radiograph. But when you administer contrast media, which produces uh, radiopacity, the stone is visible. Um, uh, within uh, this uh, contrast-enhanced area. And uh, arrow number one points to the tip of a special catheter. It's uh, called dormia basket. You introduce it into the glands duct um, as a folded uh, basket, and once it passes um, through the area occupied by the stone, it's opened, and uh, the stone is trapped in the basket. And then the basket is very carefully retrieved from the duct. So this is conventional procedure, allowing of uh, salivary stones without the necessity. 
Let's have a look at uh, the pathology of salivary glands and it's quite common that uh, the first one to be discussed is uh, developmental anomalies of salivary glands and in fact they are very rare and usually in conjunction with some other developmental anomalies and in fact uh, I have never seen in um, uh, um, agenesia of salivary glands. What you can see more clearly is uh, accessory parotid tissue, which is located in the cheek uh, to the front of a parotid gland on top of a masseter muscle, and this is an uh, ultrasound image. And these people are uh, commonly referred for ultrasound because of swelling of the cheek. Unfortunately, it's just uh, uh, anatomical variant not uh, pathology. And um, since uh, we haven't had a case of uh, agenesis of uh, parotid glands or submandibular glands, I found a case for you in literature. This is um, a patient with a missing uh, submandibular and uh, parotid glands, which results in dry mouth syndrome and then dry mouth, uh, of course, results also in loss of dental tissues, uh, extensive loss of dental uh, tissues. On the other hand, here is the image of a thyroid gland, absolutely normal. For salivary stones, you know that it's a frequent uh, disease and you can find them mostly in um, submandibular then in the parotid glands, and uh, finally, it's quite rare, it's sublingual glands and minor salivary glands within the oral uh, mucosa. When uh, you suspect uh, salivary stone, ultrasound is first choice uh, examination. Mentioned for radiopack stones, uh, radiography uh, is fine, and you can take a large variety of x rays uh, to uh, confirm the presence of radiopack stone. Ultrasound is non invasive, it's very popular. It can be performed uh, uh, in the dental school or in medical facilities, and it also demonstrates radiolucent stones, and it also uh, demonstrates lesions related to uh, calculus such as inflammation of salivary glands. And let's have a look at um, a few examples of um, salivary stones, for example, uh, that's um, uh, occlusal, axial occlusal radiograph on the mandible, and oral floor is radiolucent. You can see the uh, shadow of soft tissues of the tongue, but there is a large uh, stone in the duct of uh, sub. You can uh, image very easily with occlusal radiograph. Another uh, example ceramic radiograph, layered uh, structure of a large uh, stone. Um, uh, we don't usually use uh, cone beam CT just for uh, detection of salivary stones. Uh, they are rather incidental findings, like in this case, uh, three stones uh, located in the ducts of right submandibular glands. Um, my Clicks also combine cone beam CT with uh, contrast media administration and then uh, the um, stones can be visible also as filling defects in uh, cone beam CT. However, the resolution of cyanography performed by means of uh, cone beam CT is not as high as the resolution of uh, radiographs and the dose to the patient is uh, higher. But uh, these are cases from Nick again and from Jackie Brown, uh, from um, cone beam CT and dilated ducts of a parotid glands and the arrow points to a filling defect corresponding to a stone. But at the same time, ultrasound was performed and confirmed the same findings. So a stone and dilatation of a, a duct. For ultrasound image, uh, a stone will be uniform in, this, um, in the whole uh, human organism. So in ultrasound, 
or echoic uh, f uh, surface of a stone, and then you will have an area of the so-called post-acoustic shadowing, because uh, the ultrasound beam will be reflected off outer surface of a stone, and then it will not pass behind the posterior surface. And here uh, radiograph in an uh, unsymptomatic young female. By the way, at this time she was resident in our dental school. She took a panoramic and she found um, a radiopack area overlapping uh, the right body of a mandible. She thought a so called uh, um, uh, bo dense bone islands. But um, sometime later, she came for a CCT, and then we found out that it was not a dense bone island, but it was uh, quite a big uh, stone at the submandibular glands. Uh, so, why was she asymptomatic? It was because, uh, in fact, I explained this uh, when performing ultrasound in the same patient. Uh, the stone was large, but it did not block um, the duct because it was mobile. So it was like popping in and popping out from the gland. And um, for salivary uh, glands, just in case you want to go for sialography, uh, it will be a filling defect, and then will be duct, duct dilatation above. Move on to large and genital cysts such as branchial cysts. One of the most frequent cysts is a mucosal, which is mucus secretion, getting beyond salivary glands parenchyma, uh, often from minor salivary glands. And so yet again, ultrasound is perfect imaging modality to demonstrate um, a mucosal. And so I put here a picture of a frog, because in Latin, a frog is called renula. And frenula, it's the name given to a cyst that continues from a submandibular space to sublingual space around the posterior edge of a myelohyoid muscle. So we call it plunging renula. This uh, of uh, mucosil, and uh, I took them using intraoral probe, and every cyst will be anechoic well limited with post-acoustic enhancements uh, up through behind the posterior wall of a cyst. And this is an example of plunging ranula, much bigger than a mucosil. Uh, the previous image was from ultrasound, and this is medical CT. Uh, this is the measurement of Hounsfield units within the cyst. And uh, the low values around zero mean that uh, the cyst, uh, the lesion is filled with uh, liquid, with fluid, so this corresponds to a cyst and not. If you find cysts, multiple small rotted glands, uh, then uh, you must uh, consider the uh, possibility of HIV uh, a positive individual. Um, uh, fully developed AIDS syndrome as well, uh, because uh, the, these cysts do not occur in um, uncompromised patients. So if in the glands you see multiple uh, lesions uh, which corresponds to small cysts, uh, you should refer your patient for HIV testing. For inflammations of salivary glands, we've got acute chronic exacerbated, and they can be divided in sialadenitis, so inflammation of the parenchyma, and sialodocitis, which is inflammation of the duct itself, and of course they can be combined. In fact, for acute uh, sialadenitis, if this is a viral sialadenitis, so mumps, 
you don't uh, need any imaging diagnostics. For acute cyanotitis, you may need ultrasound to confirm inflammation and to differentiate just inflammation from abscess. So this is a case of uh, acute salabinitis in uh, parotid uh, glands with uh, areas of uh, low echogenicity and the parenchyma is non-homogeneous. Uh, we also use a Doppler phenomenon to demonstrate blood vessels in ultrasound and uh, salivary glands um, vascularization will be increased uh, in Doppler ultrasound corresponding to uh, increased vascularity in the course of inflammation. In ultrasound, we can also demonstrate dilatation of um, ducts. In this case, there was widening of parotid ducts, but no calculus was uh, confirmed. So uh, we diagnosed sialidokitis without um, sialidiasis. And um, this is uh, medical CT, axial image, soft tissue window, uh, demonstrating acute cyanidinitis of right submandibular gland. With enlargement of the gland, you can compare with the left-hand side and increased vascularity demonstrated following contrast media um, administration. And MRI image of acute parotitis also featuring multiple areas uh, of a low uh, signal intensity in an enlarged glance. Um, an abscess will be much better differentiated from normal parenchyma, it will have a wall. And since the content of parotid abscess is, uh, oh sorry, uh, is uh, fluid, it uh, does not uh, show contrast enhancement in CT or MRI. And um, it demonstrates increased vascularity in Doppler ultrasounds. And this is a parotid abscess in a medical CT. The gland is enlarged. The interior of the gland is liquid. And the masseter muscle is also enlarged. Another example of parotid abscess in uh, mag uh, magnetic resonance imaging. When we consider chronic sialadenitis, it affects mostly parotid and submandibular glands, uh, rarely sublingual glands, and it occurs uh, owing to recurrent bacterial infections and autoimmune diseases following radiotherapy. Uh, for example, during treatment of thyroid cancer with radioactive iodine, as uh, salivary glands are also cap capable of accumulation of this uh, iodine. And in, cro in chronic sialadenitis, uh, we can find increased echogenicity in ultrasound and sometimes calcifications. Uh, this was a patient uh, with chronic swelling in all our floor and ultrasound demonstrated a uh, considerable widening of submandibular uh, duct. And for ultrasound as well, this is uh, left parotid glands and uh, the echogenicity of the gland is highly increased due to fibrosis and internal streaks of uh, fibrous tissue. In fact, sialography can be quite uh, useful in demonstration of um, sialidokitis with strictures, so the narrowing of the ducts and subsequent dilatation of other portions of the ducts. And we uh, compare this image to the so-called sausage chain image. Salivary stones can be visible as well. And um, this is um, autoimmune um, disease which affects uh, all salivary glands. Uh, it's called Siegren syndrome. It also affects uh, lacrimal glands. And due to destruction of uh, glands, uh, multiple fluid collections arise from very small punctate under one millimeter in diameter to large over five millimeter in diameters. And radiology 
uh, uses a lot of comparisons, a lot of words that describe uh, some characteristic uh, radiographic appearances. So one of them is snowstorm. Of course, you cannot uh, know what it's like, but if we call our families back in Poland, they can tell us exactly that there is uh, something like that in the air, lots of these white fluffy particles of frozen water. And when the fluid collections in Siegren's syndrome are large, then we use uh, the uh, term leafless fruit bearing tree. So uh, if a, fr a tree has a lot of uh, fruits, but without leaves. Um, in fact, um, the classification of Siegren's syndrome is very similar in ultrasound and in um, sciolography. And sciolography can also be useful in diagnosis of the syndrome, unless, of course, uh, you don't have access, you have access to it. And uh, we divide uh, the uh, stages into early, medium, and advanced. And finally, the terminal stage where the whole parenchyma is completely uh, destroyed. And this is a diagram demonstrating the difference between normal uh, salivary glands and the salivary glands in the Siegren syndrome and sialadenitis. So in normal acini, the duct and the lumen of the acini is small. In sialadenitis, it's enlarged and filled with fluids. And with in Siegren syndrome, there is fluid leakage beyond the cells lining the ducts of um, the glands. So, as mentioned in our ultrasound, uh, the terminology is the same as for sialography. And I would like to show you a case of a male aged 38. And um, I remember him very well uh, because he had dry mouth syndrome, but uh, that was not uh, correctly diagnosed. Uh, he was visiting a lot of doctors and finally a dentist uh, came up with an idea of referring the patient for ultrasound. And I found out that all of his uh, major uh, salivary glands were changed by the lesions corresponding to Siegren syndrome. And why do I remember this patient so very clearly? Because he could not understand that this condition was irreversible. I was trying to tell him that the parenchyma of uh, his glands were so, was so changed by the disease that it would be impossible to recover, but it was, he was still hoping for some kind of pill that he could ingest and then uh, come back to uh, normal. Uh, Siegren syndrome can be visible also in uh, CT and in, ultrasound, and in MRI. And one of characteristic features for Siegren is uh, bilateral um, um, uh, bilateral uh, lesions, so both in uh, CT and in MRI, with enlargement of the gland and inhomogeneity due to the fluid collections. The fluid collections look different in CT and in MRI. In CT, uh, they are low density areas, and in MRI, it depends on the sequence used in T1. Weighted images, they will be low intensity areas, and in T2 uh, weighted images, they will be hyper intense. Sialosis is any enlargement of a salivary gland which is not due to inflammation. And um, it can be due, for example, to some neurological diseases or in patients with long course of uh, diabetes. And this is an example of a female patient aged uh, 75, and she has been suffering uh, for diabetes type 1 for over five, 50 years. And when she visited me for ultrasound, uh, she presented with signs of sialosis in the glands. And this is a medical CT, also bilateral enlargements of uh, parotid glands with uh, in decreased density, the lesions are well limited, and the glands are non-homogeneous. And uh, last but not least, let's talk about the tumors of salivary glands. 
The most common tumor is polymorphic adenoma, which is benign mixed tumor. Uh, less common, but also found in uh, salivary glands is the Wartin's tumors, and some other tumors are less uh, frequent. Uh, for polymorphic adenoma, it's also called benign uh, mixed uh, tumor. It's the most common salivary glands tumor, and we call it pleomorphic, so it means that it has a lot of uh, faces, that it's non-homogeneous. That's why we also call it mixed. And small tumors may be asymptomatic, well-defined, hypoechoic in ultrasound, hypodense in uh, uh, CT, and they, look, they do not look specific. With uh, bigger glands, uh, they are polycyclic, and um, they also contain heterogeneous lesions. Uh, they, can, uh, they can contain uh, small calcifications. So a small pleomorphic adenoma may look identical as a cyst. Uh, internal echogenicity is slightly higher than in case of a cyst, but you still can see um, um, post in, um, post acoustic enhancements. Uh, when you uh, use Doppler ultrasounds to demonstrate vascularization, pleomorphic adenoma is very poorly supplied with blood vessels, so it may really look like a cyst. And so to confirm whether this is a cyst or, or adenoma, you should perform a small needle uh, biopsy. Uh, one of the um, newest developments in uh, ultrasound uh, diagnostics is the use of the so-called elastography. Um, it's just like uh, you examine your patients with palpation and you can feel whether a lesion is uh, firm or solid or whether the lesion is flexible if it's soft. So elastography uh, helps you to determine whether the area is uh, firm or whether it's soft. And of course, the soft lesions, they are more commonly benign, <coughs> sorry, and the firm lesions are more commonly uh, malignant because they contain a lot of fibrous tissue. <coughs> sorry. So pleomorphic adenoma, uh, we can also observe them in uh, CT and MRI, and uh, they also um, are heterogeneous in these imaging diagnostic studies. They are pleomorphic, as the name of the uh, study says. <coughs> the second most common um, salivary glands tumor, it's Wartin tumor. And this is characteristic because it contains uh, fluid areas, cystic areas. That's why when you find uh, a cystic area in a salivary gland, especially parotid, especially bilateral, you must not forget the possibility of a Wartin's tumor. And um, as I have already mentioned, they tend to be bilateral. So if you find a tumor in one parotid, do not hesitate to have a look in the other parotids. And um, of course, when you perform ultrasound of salivary glands, it's mandatory that you survey all the glands during one examination. And so with Wartin's tumors, uh, follow-up uh, diagnostic imaging is also mandatory as relapse is uh, frequent. This is a case of a male with a large uh, tumor in uh, left parotid gland containing a lot of uh, cystic areas with septa. And uh, this was confirmed by surgery to be a Wartin's tumor. Another case of Wartin's tumor with a cystic um, interior, this is MRI imaging, axial images of a left parotid T1 weighted imaging uh, following contrast enhancement and T2 weighted imaging. So in T2, you've got a uh, high intensity uh, cystic component of a lesion and in T1 contrast enhancement is uh, visible. This is a medical CT and this is also MRI. 
axial images of 14 tumors with large compartments filled with uh, liquids. For, um, oh, sorry, I went probably the other way around. So, okay, so for Wartis tumors, we can also perform elastography. However, the results of uh, these studies of firmness of the teeth are not as convincing for uh, maxillofacial tumors as, for example, for breast tumors. Nowadays, uh, in ultrasound of breast tumors, elastography is mandatory because we know that breast cancer is solid, is firm, it contains a lot of uh, fibrous tissue. In case of salivary glands, the findings are not that uh, conclusive. Another case of Wartin's tumors in ultrasound with a cystic uh, component. And uh, this is a uh, history of uh, our patients. Uh, in 2007, uh, he had uh, Wartin's tumors excised together with superficial lobe of the right parotids. And in 2013, he experienced relapse and he came to us for follow-up with no relapse uh, in the parotid glands. This is just an intragranular lymph node in this um, uh, parotid glands. Hemangioma is benign tumor composed of blood vessels, so of vascular origin. Uh, these tumors can be inborn and they tend to recede uh, around the age of six, seven years. Uh, they uh, are the most prevalent salivary glands of ch tumors in children because the children are not uh, so commonly affected by other parotids or submandibular glands. And since the tumors um, are very rich in blood vessels, ultrasound will demonstrate increased blood flow in color Doppler and pallor Doppler studies. For benign, for benign tumors, we also have a lipoma, uh, which is benign tumor derived from mature fat tissue. And histopathology determines uh, imaging findings, so the echogenicity and ultrasound is very similar uh, to normal fat tissue. And um, that, that was a lipoma. In fact, this is not parotid gland, this is the neck, but this gives you an idea of a tumor which is very similar to normal fat pet uh, tissue. Mucca empoidermoids uh, tumor is the most common malignant tumor of salivary glands. And um, up to 15% of all salivary glands are mucoepidermoid tumors. Uh, it appears mostly in middle-aged patients. And imaging findings depend largely on maturity of uh, the tissues composing the tumor. So if uh, cells are highly differentiated, it can mimic a pleomorphic adenoma and poorly differentiated tumors are illimited and hypoechoic in ultrasounds. Uh, this is a case of um, mucoepidermoid uh, tumor with uh, low echogenicity in ultrasound, but in uh, um, elastography study, it's very firm. Uh, here uh, you can see, see the scale. This is quantitative uh, elastography that demonstrates the stiffness of tissue in kilopascals. So the red areas means that, mean that the tumor is very stiff. Okay. A cynical coma uh, is uh, less frequent and uh, rich cells without serous so then they have higher echogenicity in ultrasound and uh, in general imaging findings are not specific but this tumor uh, is worth your attention because it tends to spread along the nerves to the so it's called perineural spread and also this metastasis are possible and uh, squamous cell carcinoma is not that frequent. Unfortunately, uh, the appearance is non-specific. So every time you find 
lesion in parotid or submandibular gland. Of course, a confirmation by histopathology is necessary. Uh, the easiest way is to perform fine needle aspiration biopsy, uh, but also um, uh, histopathology uh, with um, specimen is confirmation. Unfortunately, lymphoma also can be found in the, the oral cavity. Um, since parotid glands is very rich in intragranular lymph nodes, then lymphoma arises most commonly in the parotid glands, much more commonly than in submandibular glands. And also the Siegren syndrome increases the risk of uh, lymphoma. Uh, we've got um, a syndrome which was named by a Polish scientist, uh, Jan Mi uh, von Mikulic Radetzky. And Mikulic disease, it was uh, reported more than 120 years ago. And it was mild lymphoma of both salivary glands and lacrimal glands, which we know now. Um, ultrasound of lymphoma demonstrates single or multiple tumor, fairly well limited with low echogenicity. And um, you can also find malignant variants of pleomorphic adenoma after malignant transformation from a benign pleomorphic uh, adenoma. And also uh, the imaging findings are non-specific uh, with ill-limited uh, malignancy. Last but not least, uh, salivary glands can be affected by uh, metastatic tumors and um, metastases are responsible for 40% of malignant tumors of salivary glands and they came from a wide variety of tumors including malignant melanoma, head and neck carcinoma like squamous cell carcinoma, a GI tract tumors, breast, lungs, and prostate glands. And so, since again imaging findings are non-specific, biopsy uh, is necessary and as always in every patient uh, the diagnosis must be made in conjunction with clinical picture, the history in the patients. And so that's um, inhomogeneous lesion in um, right submandibular glands with areas of uh, higher and lower agogenicity. And it was confirmed uh, by histopathology to be metastasis from malignant pleural mesothelioma. And um, for, um, yes, we have already uh, covered uh, this, sorry for, for that. Okay, uh, one more picture I would like to show. This is uh, lymphoma, this is a CT of uh, mold lymphoma. It looks um, similar to Siegren syndrome maybe, but uh, the tumors tend to spread, the tumors tend to increase, and the Siegren syndrome will progress towards uh, the uh, fibrotic degeneration of the glands.